CataractCoach.com, another dropping nucleus. So what's the correct management of this case? There goes the nucleus into the vitreous. Again, we have an anonymous surgeon who's operating this case. Let's speed things up here. Four times normal speed. Getting a groove made down the middle of that nucleus. Obviously, the rex has already been done. And let's zoom in here and be cautious. Don't go too deep on that groove, right? Remember to make that groove deeper in the center, but shallower towards the lens equator. And then splitting the nucleus here, let's see if we can figure out when the issue arises. So more viscoelastic. Faco Pro back in the eye. Chopper going in as well. And let's look here. Oh, that's a deep spot. I don't like that one spot there nasally. Yep. Splitting the nucleus. Let's see what happens. Remember one thing. I'll tell you a very important pearl here. You ever meet another fellow cataract surgeon and you say, Hey, have you ever dropped the nucleus? I'll wait for the answer. And remember this one saying. Two types of doctors never have complications. Those who don't operate and those who aren't quite fully truthful. If you've met a cataract surgeon who's done at least a few thousand surgeries, 100% chance he or she has had a drop in nucleus. Because remember, it's not always your fault. It's not always your fault. It's not, I always, it's not always an iatrogenic issue. What if the patient had bad trauma? What if the patient had an intravitreal injection which damaged that? What if the patient has a posterior polar cataract? What if the patient has terrible zonor support? There are all kinds of reasons. All kinds of reasons. The key is, how do you react to it? And let's watch that carefully here. So again, we're showing you this video four times normal speed. The surgeon obviously is stressed out because look what happens. A lot of accommodation. The surgeon has a clear view through the oculars because they're accommodating. But look at the view here in our microscope. A little bit blurry now. So getting the pieces out of the capture bag, really hard to make out any details. Again, it's a little bit out of focus, but it's an important lesson here. So it's why I'm showing you the video. And if you're a subscriber, as you should be, you know, two days ago, we just had another um, case of a drop nucleus. So here you can see there's a lot of difficulty in rotating that hemi-nucleus. Just does not want to rotate. And that, what does that tell you? That tells you it's probably engulfed in vitreous or... It's stuck on an irregular part of the caps or bag or the poster caps open. Look at that red reflex, too. It's a little too clear. So assistant now uses Sinsky to help to rotate the nucleus, but that's pretty dangerous. The assistant's not really in control of the eye, and you see you still can't move that nucleus around. So not sure if that's the greatest idea. And so you can see now at high speed, four times speed, you can see just how much movement there is. So now... The remaining nuclear piece here, if you can't rotate it, my advice would be get it out of the bag. Look at the corneal incisions now, by the way. Look how much edema there is in the cornea. That just tells you how much leakage there's from the incisions and how long you've been inside. Look at that bright red reflex. <sighs> what does that tell you? Oh, that's a bright red reflex. That means there's no capsule in that quadrant. No cortex, no capsule, nothing. Now, poor followability, another bad sign. It's already in the vitreous. Look, it's already in the anterior vitreous, falling into the mid vitreous. This is not something you can chase after now. Once the piece of nucleus is engulfed in vitreous, you can't chase it because you're going to put a ton of traction on that vitreous and that's going to cause a detachment. Now, even if you manage it perfectly fine and textbook management or the exact way we show you, the patient can still have a higher risk of post-op issues like retinal detachment, retinal break, vision loss, endophthalmitis is much higher, cystoid macular edema is much higher. There are a lot of issues that can happen here. And so important to watch these patients closely in the post-op period. So at this point, taking the pieces out, listen to your machine. If your fake machine goes ding, 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 ding while you're doing the phaco part, you may have vitreous already clogging the tip of your phaco sleeve. The phaco tip there, phaco needle. So be cautious there. So in a case like this, you'd be, that, look, that's already falling. Just let it go. Let it go. Trust me. Phaco probes in the eye. I like that move. Putting viscoelastic in. And you can examine if you want anymore. But now's the time to close this up. Look at the edema around that main incision. You're going to make the retina doctor's view a lot harder. So let that thing go back there. More viscoelastic going in there. Looks like a little bit of nicking of the iris in this, in this step as well. Now, you can clean this up. Oh, there's the iris bleeding now. So we're getting the vitrectomy set up. Close the main incision. Do not do a vitrectomy through the main incision. It leaks way too much. You need to do it as a bimanual approach. 23 gauges is what I typically recommend. 
and through two separate incisions. There you go, 23 gauge vitrectomy. You better know the difference between IA cut and anti vitrectomy. So now to clean up all the vitreous this prolapse, it should be on anti vitrectomy mode. Position one on the foot paddle is irrigation, two is the vitrectomy cutter, and number three on your foot pedal is the vacuum. Because you want to cut little bits of vitreous and then aspirate them. So now trampsinolone goes in, and you can see there is a lot of vitreous in the front of this eye, a lot. This is going to take time to clean up. Now the whole video, unedited, one hour. So don't think because you're watching this video in seven minutes, like, oh, it's slam dunk, I'll just do it next. No. You need to stop, take your time, and do what's best for this patient. And you can see the nuclear pieces are already in the vitreous. Let them go. Your vitreoretinal colleague will clean that up for you. Patient will get a full pars plane of vitrectomy, pars plane of lensectomy. It'll be fine. You can also leave the eye a fake for now. It's okay. Your, your vitreoretinal colleagues, they can clean up everything. Clean up the prolapse vitreous, take out the nucleus, ensure that retina is totally attached, and they can put the lens in too. Let them know what you want, and this, this case should have reasonable zonular uh, support for sulcus lens. So here again, cleaning up at the end, tough case, but remember, this happens to all of us. It's not whether or not you get this complication, because I can already tell you you're going to get it if you haven't already, multiple times throughout your career. It's how do you manage it? And in this case, we have to do what's best for the patient, which is manage it in a conservative manner. Clean up. Let's get the eye closed. Let's get the patient on to our vitreoretinal colleagues. And all that triamcinolone that's back in the vitreous cavity, leave it be. It'll all come out when the vitrectomy is performed by the retina surgeon. And it'll also help with controlling post-op inflammation. Remember to watch these eyes very carefully because they have a higher rate of endophthalmitis. So off to the retinal, retinal colleague it goes and everything will be just fine.